I was driving along Ridge Road to Grandview Hospital when to the right side of the road I happened to see a piece of property up for sale. And I thought, my, wouldn't this be a wonderful place to plant a church? Uh, it's a location, I think, that's strategic for the advance of the gospel, uh, just off of Route 309, uh, along off the intersection of two uh, important roads in this area. People can come from quite a distance to uh, visit a church planted there or placed there. So maybe someday we'll make a move there. Who knows? But there are different ways in which we can advance the gospel of Christ. Uh, we are to be a mission-oriented church, a church that has the desire not only to come together and enjoy Christian fellowship, worshiping Christ, uh, growing together in our faith, but also a church that reaches out into the community, reaches out into the world, even perhaps sends people off into the world for Christian ministry and service for the sake of the gospel. All of Christ's church is a mission church that is part of its character. We should never be simply an ingrown church looking at ourselves, but always looking out. Where would God have me present the gospel? Where can new churches be planted? How can God's kingdom advance in different places in this region and around the world? There are any number of communities around here that still need a solid, biblically based, reformed Christian church. There's plenty of room for growth in this region. What is more, certainly all around the world, there's plenty of opportunity for advancing the gospel of Christ. Will you capture a vision for this mission church, a mission-oriented church that brings people into this particular location to hear the gospel of Christ, but also reaches out even beyond our doors, supporting mission efforts in different places, either through prayer, perhaps even by attendance, or even leadership in those different uh, church plants. What would God have for you? We come in this 13th chapter of the book of Acts to a church plant that began rather spectacularly in the advance of the gospel among Gentile converts. The church in Antioch, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, was situated in the third largest city in the Roman Empire of its day. The city had half a million inhabitants, and the church itself was a rather large church. If you go back to the 11th chapter, verses 21 and 24, you see twice there, Luke records the fact that great numbers of people came to the Lord. In verse 21, Luke records that many people believed and trusted in the Lord. And then in verse 24, the same thing is basically said, many were brought to the Lord. I find it rather interesting that the different terminology being used there first, Obviously, the one main point I want to make is that many people came to faith in Christ there in that city. This was a large, flourishing church. Now, it may be that it was more of a house church kind of setting where there were a variety of churches within the city of Antioch. And perhaps from time to time, they would gather together at one place for corporate worship. Everybody together. But the... However, they structured the church there. It was a large, flourishing church. But I find it interesting the language used to describe these people coming to the Lord. First, they, they believed in the Lord and trusted in Him. So God does this work within their hearts so they trust in Him. And then, verse 24 says, they were brought to the Lord. Now, that might be the powerful drawing of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, bringing them to Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of what Jesus says in John chapter 6, where he talks about how uh, people are drawn to Christ. And the word that he uses there is like being drawn with cords, almost forcibly drawn. There's a powerful, effectual work of the Holy Spirit in an individual's life such that they gladly drop their sins and follow after Christ. And so the writer says, first they believed and trusted in the Lord Jesus, and then second they were brought to the Lord Jesus, powerfully moved by the Spirit of God. But maybe also brought to the Lord Jesus by members of the church. 
You said to the neighbors and friends, come and hear. Hear the glad tidings of salvation. Hear the promise of new life. Hear about the forgiveness of all of our sins, which is provided in a sufficient sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Come and hear. And so there might be that aspect as well as the people of God brought friends and neighbors to hear the gospel of Christ. So we're reminded very early on here that salvation is the sovereign work of God by His grace. At the same time, people are responsible. They act in bringing their neighbors and friends to Christ. In any case, this was a large church, a flourishing church here in this large cosmopolitan city. We should note some of the aspects of this church which are rather unique in its composition. And by the way, I should note, I more than likely we'll just focus on the first three verses of chapter 13. So we'll pick up the remainder next time. So if you see that I'm spending a lot of time on the first three verses, don't get discouraged. I think you still got another nine verses to go. As this congregation gathers together, it has a, a number of things that we should note with regard to its composition. First of all, it's composed of prophets and teachers. There is a distinction between the two gifts within the early church. You remember that the apostle Paul, who was one of those who were here in Antioch, Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 2 that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And I think more than likely, Paul is not so much talking about Old Testament prophets and the Old Covenant scriptures. Certainly, the church is built on them. We have an inheritance that we receive from the Old Covenant Scriptures. We are one people with the Old Covenant Church. But he has in mind here these New Testament prophets, much like Agabus, who came from Jerusalem to Antioch and prophesied of uh, a great famine that was to come across the whole Roman Empire. These men who, who God revealed certain things to and spoke inspired words dramatically within the early church. This was a special gift of the Holy Spirit during this period of time when they, they did not have the canon of Scripture composed for them. And so Christ blessed His church with prophets, not only apostles, as Paul would be, but also prophets and teachers. Prophets would foretell the Word of God, explain God's Word, but also perhaps from time to time give revelation from God, as apparently took place here when they spoke of what the Holy Spirit said regarding setting aside Barnabas and Saul for the work that he would give to them. So there, there were prophets in the church there at Antioch, and there were teachers, those whose business it was to explain the scriptures in ways that are understandable to God's people ministering to them such that they understand what God has done for them and what God expects of them as to how they should live before Him. These teachers would faithfully explain the Scriptures to God's people. They have a special gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the church is a community of the Holy Spirit, blessed by the Spirit with a variety of gifts. Paul, again, speaks in great detail of those gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and chapter 14 and in other places as well. The Spirit comes and gives many gifts to the church, enabling them to conduct their service in God's kingdom. This particular church, Luke records that there were prophets and teachers. And he lists the names of these men who were involved in the early church. You would note here that there was a plurality of leaders within the church, equally in service to one another and over the church. This is, if you will, a Presbyterian form of church government. The church was led not by a single individual making decisions for everybody else, but by a plurality of ordained men. Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaeum, and Saul, five men at this point, who mutually had responsibility over the church there in Antioch. This is different from some other churches that have a more hierarchical arrangement. Now, we have a hierarchical arrangement in the Presbyterian Church, 
but not a monarchical arrangement where one individual makes all the decisions. In the local church, whether it's a, a Baptist independent church or a, a other, like a Roman Catholic or Episcopalian church, or over regions in Episcopalian and uh, Catholic churches going up the line until you have one perhaps at the top of the ladder. Here you have multiple leaders leading the church. And that's for our good and protection. You'll note that these multiple leaders were responsible for setting aside Saul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry. It wasn't just the congregation who decided they would send some folks out into the mission field and then sent them off on their way. It was the authorized, ordained leadership of the church that laid hands on Saul and Barnabas and set them apart for their ministry. So there was a church structure in place. And these who understood the gospel, understood the ministry of the gospel, were responsible for putting others into service or commissioning them into fields of service. That's for the protection of the church, such that those who go off into service are indeed qualified for that work. These are men who understand the gospel and are equipped spiritually with the gifts necessary to advance the church. That's why we have a presbytery that ordains men into the ministry after examining them for their faith in life, their understanding of the gospel. We just don't leave it to congregations to pick who they please and send them off. Or individuals just simply rise up and go on their own and say, I'm going to be a pastor. There needs to be this church structure in place for the sake of the health and well-being of the church. And so there's this plurality of men, and it's an interesting collection of men in, involved here. Barnabas we know fairly well. He was one of the earliest uh, disciples of Christ who was known for his generosity in the early church, helping out with those who were poor and needy, selling his property to uh, encourage them. He was called a son of encouragement, such that his preaching and teaching was encouraging to the people of God to follow Christ. He was a beloved man. Uh, Luke would record of him, in, I believe it's in the 11th chapter, that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. This was Barnabas. And the, the, the church in Jerusalem had such confidence in Barnabas that they sent him to Antioch when they heard of the church being established in Antioch to see how things are going, ensure that it's well-ordered and structured, and, and to teach there. And when the, the church in Antioch grew and flourished, Barnabas was the one who sought out Saul and brought him in, adding to the leadership component there in Antioch. Barnabas, a good man, a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He's one of the leaders in that church. The church is blessed when you have men like that. And who are good, filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. And then Luke records three other names which we know very little about. In some respects, they pass on into uh, history uh, without much comment. There's Simeon, uh, who's also called Niger. Niger is a word which means black, so he might have been of dark complexion. He's probably a Jewish man with the, the, the name Simeon, but dark complexion, perhaps even black hair, as Matthew Henry suggests. But in any case, <coughs> he has a nickname, Simeon. Then Lucius of Cyrene. Some folks wonder if this isn't Luke himself, who was there in Antioch. Uh, Lucius is a, a name for Luke uh, from Cyrene, uh, which is from uh, Libya, a city in Libya, North Africa. He might have been uh, a Libyan black man, he might have been uh, a Jewish man, in, in any case he has a Latin name, and he comes there to Antioch. And finally, Menahem, who has an interesting history. He was raised with Herod Antipas. Herod, who in the pages of scripture was responsible for 
chopping off the head of John the Baptist and taking part in the crucifixion of Christ. Menahem was a foster child in Herod's family, or at least raised up with Herod in the king's court. He knew Herod. He was a lifelong friend of Herod. And yet God had so changed him that he's now an elder in the church, a teacher of the church, ministering the gospel in the great city of Antioch. An interesting story. Two lives raised similarly but going in quite different directions. Has God done that in your life? Raising you perhaps in a family where some go one direction and you go on another. God's grace is particular and effectual in this people. And finally, Saul is listed, the last one, who perhaps is the youngest of them all and somewhat new to the scene. He and Barnabas had been working in the city of Antioch for about a year, teaching effectively great crowds of people again. Acts chapter 11 says, so there's, there's this emphasis on a large flourishing church there in Antioch. And Saul and Barnabas were very effective in their teaching ministry within that church. So we have this great fellowship of the saints. A great crowd of people gathering to hear this glorious ministry of a plurality of leaders. Men gifted by the Holy Spirit, prophets and teachers who explain the gospel to them, a great fellowship of the saints together, ordered and structured by the Spirit. It's also a fellowship of the Spirit who dwells among His congregation and leads the church. You know, sometimes when we think about missions, there are some who suggest that by becoming mature in your faith, by advancing in Christian uh, doctrine, you become less useful to the Lord for evangelism and Christian ministry. And that's because you begin to lose your uh, secular friends as you come into the church and become focused on the ministry of the church. Now, there is some pure truth to that. As you enter into the ministry, you're focused very much on the ministry of the Word. You're oftentimes with the people of God, encouraging them, lifting them up. But doesn't God bring in people from outside the church to hear these folks? What is more, what we have here is a church that is committed to worship. A mature church that is given over to the Lord and His service. The ministry of the Word flourishes in this congregation. And it's not the obscure that are chosen for mission or those who are new to their faith or are commissioned for evangelism and missionary work. It's those who are mature in their faith. Barnabas and Saul. Those who are effective in teaching the gospel. These who are disciple makers. These men were entrusted with the ministry of the church, or the ministry of reaching the lost. One of the things that I think we should uh, appreciate from this text is that <coughs> missions begin in worship. Missions begin when the congregation of the Lord draws near to the Lord and sees Him in His glory, understands the full nature of the gospel message, matures in her faith and is strengthened in that faith. It's when we see the glory of God, the exaltation of Christ, His Lordship over the heavens and the earth, when we are convinced of these things, that we are made bold, that we are clear in our understanding of the gospel, that we are equipped to challenge the ways of thinking in the world today and advance the gospel of Christ. Missions begins in worship. And so don't dismiss the gathering of God's people for worship on a Sunday morning. Don't dismiss the preaching of the word, the teaching of the ministry of the church here. Don't say, well, I need to be out ministering to the bars and the, the rough neighborhoods and so forth. You may need to do that, certainly. But you need to be taught and instructed in your faith. 
so that you are equipped and ready to give an answer for your faith. Today especially, there are all kinds of challenges to your understanding of the Christian faith. Moral relativism, uh, humanism, that are rampant today, Islam and all its perversions, rampant today, all kinds of things challenging, the New Age movement, all kinds of things challenging the Christian as he goes out into the world. Do you have an answer for these things? Can you explain the truths of the gospel? Can you explain how Christ is more excellent and superior to anything else? Can you show the effectiveness of Christ's cross and resurrection? Do you understand why it is we can proclaim peace with God and everlasting life? You need to mature in Christ and be equipped for service. Worship the Lord, then go out and serve and be missionaries in the world today. So this church is a fellowship of the Spirit directed by the Spirit to set aside folks for the ministry of the Gospel in different places. One thing about the Holy Spirit, which I find fascinating here, and I didn't see anybody else comment on it, so take this for the grain of salt. But you have the Holy Spirit saying, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I prepared for them. Who met with Saul on the road to Damascus? It was the risen Lord Jesus. To me, I'm struck with the thought that you have Christ himself giving Saul his mission as a, 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 an apostle to the Gentile nations of the earth. Christ himself gives him this mission. And yet here we see in Acts 13, the Spirit gives Saul and Barnabas this mission to go out into the, all the earth. The Spirit and the Son are united in this great work. The Son's work is the Spirit's work. The Son's command is the Spirit's command. There's such a unity in the work of the Son and the Spirit that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18, that the Lord is the Spirit. There's such unity here that they are indistinguishable at times. God is one, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit says, set them apart for the work that I have prepared for them. This great unity of the Spirit with the Son, I think, should be noted. Finally, uh, the Spirit calls these men into His service and equips them for the work and then ordains that they should be sent and to anticipate one thing. In the fourth verse of Acts 13, you say that the Spirit sends them out. The third verse of the chapter says the uh, leaders in the church there laid hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them out. The Spirit works in concert with His church, with the church that trusts in Christ. <laughs> and we should not dismiss the organized work of the church in missions or church planting, what have you. The Spirit works with the church. Sometimes the church works rather slowly <laughs> and ponderously. But the Spirit works with the church through the various responsibilities of the church, including ordination to service, laying on of hands, prayer and fasting. There is a place for the organized church. And those who go outside the church in various kinds of parachurch kinds of ministries, without any submission to a church body, I think are in disobedience to the Holy Spirit here and His intention to work within the life of the church. We should always be subject to Christ and His church and not just simply cast that aside and go off on our own as lone rangers doing what we please. We are subject to Christ, subject to His church, subject to the elders He's placed in His church, always subject to Christ. In conclusion, 
When I was a boy, I read a wide variety of things, but I read a biography of a Scottish missionary to some islands off of Australia named the New Hebrides. His name was John G. Patton. He lived during the latter part of the 1800s until the first part of the 1900s. He goes to these uh, islands where the natives there have never heard the gospel of Christ. Rather, the opposite, they are really savages. They are cannibals. And he's there among them as a Scotsman, a white man, uh, trying to present the gospel to these natives. And the book is an amazing story of many ways in which God delivered him from the various wars and strifes and threats to his own life and all the atrocities they had seen as people done all kinds of unimaginable things. But he preached the gospel there. He took his first wife there and she caught a fever after childbirth and both her and her child passed away. He comes back to Scotland to raise more money for the, the, the mission. He tries to get a boat also to travel about to the different islands. In any case, he meets another woman. Oddly enough, she marries him and goes off with him back to uh, the New Hebrides. And he labors there for years, translating the scriptures into their native language, uh, providing a hospital for them, tending to their physical needs, and preaching, teaching. His wife leads a sewing class and teaches the women all kinds of skills. And they minister to them until the island on which they are, are serving becomes Christian. Amazingly. What motivated John Patton to leave Scotland, a place of civilization and order, the highest place in the world? <laughs> Sorry, my Scotch gets into me here. <laughs> and go to the end of the world off of Australia among savages who are cannibals who at any moment, at any point in time, cut off his head and do unimaginable things. What motivated a man to do this? He grew up in a family with, he was the first of, I think, about eight or ten children in his father's home. His father owned a business. It escapes me at the moment, but he worked 14 hours a day in that business. And then two hours a day was given to study and reading and preparing for the scriptures. And he said that he would see his father three times a day enter into his prayer closet to pray for all kinds of things. And then twice a day we meet with the family for prayers. His father knew the glory of God. His father was transformed by the majesty of God. He worshipped God. And that made an impression on John Patton. An indelible impression. And he says that it came time when he was prepared to go off to the mission field as a young man. He's going off and his father's walking with him along this journey. And it comes to the point where they have to separate and his father's praying for him and talking with him and giving them counsel as they go along. And you can see it's a very emotional moment when they part ways. And they say their farewells and the son walks off into the distance. And he walks and walks and he can't look back until finally comes to this one point where he knows he'll not be able to see his father again. He looks back and there is his father with nothing on his head watching his son go. Praying for him the whole time. Worship leads to mission. Worship leads to mission. If you know Christ, you'll be moved to go and make disciples of all the nations of the earth. That great commission is written on John Patton's tombstone in Australia uh, with his wife there buried at his side, his second wife and two of their children. Go and make disciples. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way in which you form and organize your church. 
We thank you for the way that you raise up those who would serve in that great mission, that great calling of, the, of advancing Christ. And we pray that we too would be moved to worship you, to see you in your glory, to understand the unfathomable riches of your word, to be moved by them to preach to others of the great salvation that you have provided for us in Christ, and the great new life that you have for us in Christ. Grant us grace to be absorbed by these things, and to share them with all who will listen. And we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name.